Crash Bandicoot, that series that was seemingly created to have a genre of platformers on the PlayStation and of course to rival the Super Mario Man. In 2017, the first three mainline Crash games, Crash Bandicoot 1, 2, and 4, were beautifully remade for all modern platforms. Let's talk about them. Mainly the games themselves rather than the fact that they were remade because I barely remember playing these. If I even did it all, I, I don't even remember. My favorite genre of games is platformers, more specifically collectathons. Better than most of the modern stuff put out today, honestly. I'm sick of running around shooting guns, playing $20 mobile games, when I could be exploring areas collecting things. I, I am a boomer. I'm an 18 year old boomer. Steam recommends games based off titles you enjoy. I have well over 200 plus hours logged on Spongebob, and even probably about 20 extra from playing different revisions offline. So obviously I was going to try to recommend some games similar to it. You know, so I could spend money. I saw the Crash Bandicoot Insane Trilogy on the side. I was very tempted to buy the bundle that comes with both Spyro and Crash, but I was not quite sure about Spyro. I had no idea if I'd enjoy it. Now I'm asking you. Do I buy Spyro now? I'm really tempted to, but haven't looked into the series much. It was not something I grew up with. Maybe I'll buy it and make a video on it, I don't know. I know I mentioned I was into collectathons, but the first three Crash Bandicoot games are mainly basic platformers. I wasn't exactly aware of this. I have very, very, very vague memories of seeing the games played on the PS1 well over a decade ago. I can't even recall if I was one of the people who played them. Basically, there was a PS1 at a relative's house during Christmas Eve parties, and that's how the time was spent. Alright, enough talking, let's get into the game itself. Ready? It's like 20 gigabytes, download it, load it up. Activision presents a smashing blast from the past. Developed by Vicarious Visions. It's Crash Bandicoot. I love the intro to this game, it's kinda stupid though. Here we are, the Insane Trilogy. Get it? N? Like Neo Cortex? Such a funny joke, moving on. Initially, I had a problem with this game where it was running like absolute garbage and I was kinda scared it was going to run like this, which made absolutely no sense because I was running this off of 2060 at the time and the game is 3 years old, but yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure how this major problem slipped through. I need to manually swap the GPU in the NVIDIA control panel. Okay, now back to the game. Also, one more thing. This game does not have native 21x9 support. I needed to install a mod to use it, and it literally works just fine. Why this wasn't implemented? There are a couple times where you can see weird stuff out of bounds, but they easily could have covered this up. Lazy. The title screen is pretty basic, but it doesn't need to be anything complex. You got the three games, Crash 1, Crash 2, and... <laughs> Quick note, when I critique these games, I'm referring to the games themselves, not the remakes if that makes any sense. In the sense of remaking these games, they did it perfectly. Staying faithful to the originals? Absolutely, they did it perfectly. Okay, now let's go over the game, shall we? Crash Bandicoot 1. Okay, before we go any further, I need to point out the obvious. The graphics here, in the remakes, are absolutely beautiful. Every section in this game looks amazing. Sometimes these games straight up look like animated movies. Everything about the visuals is really nice. Obviously an improvement. The mechanics, they vary throughout each game here, but let's go over Crash 1's. Crash can walk, jump, and spin. Yeah, very basic. You can tap the jump button for a short jump and hold it for a longer jump. The jump is still pretty bad though. Spinning is done as an attack. If you can't tell already, this game is an extremely basic platformer. You can tell this is a very early game in the series, I mean, f***ing obviously. The main objective in each stage is to simply get to the end. You do a couple levels then face Papu Papu, a very easy boss, you just jump in his head. There was this one stage after this I thought was kinda creative, you can jump in an area and walk in a place most players would assume is out of bounds but actually isn't, you can collect some Wampa Fruit here. Wampa Fruit are useful because if you collect a hundred of them, you get an extra life. Also, you may have noticed these so-called face tokens, it said it in the, uh, the loading screen once. You collect three of them to access the bonus areas of levels where you can collect more wampa fruit, lives, and break more boxes. I'll get to the boxes in a bit. When you die in these games, you get sent back to the last checkpoint box you open, and sometimes the deaths in this game can feel really cheap. It sort of reminds me of Super Mario World, the mushrooms being the Aku Aku masks. You get hit and you lose one, just like losing a power in Super Mario. Unlike Mario though, if you collect three, you turn invincible for a short period of time, basically a power star. Later on, you ride a hog, do some levels, then fight Riveru. This boss is kind of annoying. There's probably some sort of trick to this, but I really did feel like I was randomly pressing the TNT boxes just hoping for them to explode next to him. He jumps a lot, which makes it difficult to hit. You do some more different style levels, eventually fight Koala Khan, who uh, skipped leg day. You do some factory style levels, these were pretty cool, but definitely challenging 
challenging. Pinstripe Potteru is who you fight next. He loves his guns, so you need to take cover behind the couch and hit him whenever he needs to reload. A couple levels are after this one, and one of them is very long. Yeah, this only exists because you're supposed to come back here after getting 100%. Okay, yeah, it's time to talk about the boxes. The boxes. After beating a stage normally for the first time without any objectives in mind, you're probably gonna get a screen that says great, but you missed a certain amount of boxes and it's usually going to be pretty high. In order to 100% these games, you need to break every single box in every stage. This sucks. Yeah, I'm not going to get 100% in this game. Even if you feel like you got all of them, I guarantee you missed some. It's very stupid. In my opinion, this feels like a very lazy way to add extra content into the game and to sort of pad it out since it's pretty short. Imagine if in Super Mario you had to collect every coin in order to 100% the game. It's dumb. The final boss, Neo Cortex, is pretty hard. It doesn't help that every time you die, he repeats the same line over and over. Darn you, Crash Bandicoot! Yeah, die you, Crash Bandicoot. Why does he have to say Bandicoot? After. You have to deflect the green electricity balls towards him while simultaneously avoiding the purple ones. And yeah, that's Crash 1. Moving on, let's talk about the positives. What do I like about this game? The boss fights were very creative and all very different. It was certainly challenging. Obviously the graphics, yeah, nice. I couldn't use this point about the actual Crash 1 though. This game, as mentioned before, is very basic. After playing this, you can just tell you played a PS1 game in HD. That's all this game is to me. The other two games are much better though, honestly. And plus, they don't have the stupid fucking boxes shit. Ron, 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 this is incorrect. You you still need to break the boxes in them for a true 100%. I thought they fixed a problem, but they didn't. 100% for all three of these games is really confusing to me because I'm a simpleton. I asked in speedrunning Discord for this game for someone to give me a quick rundown of how it works and... What the fuck is it? Why do the numbers randomly go over 100%? Alright, this shit is dumb, I'm never 100 percent these games. Crash Bandicoot 2, Cortex Strikes Back. Unlike Crash 1, this game sort of has a hub world. It's not a massive area like Delfino Plaza, rather a cramped series of rooms you take an elevator to get to. This gives you a bit more freedom with the order you choose to play the levels in. Before each boss, you can play the levels in the room in any order you'd like. After beating all the levels and the boss for each room, you get the ability to move up on the elevator to access another room with more levels and another boss. This game and Crash 3 also still have bonus stages, but they're right in the open and you don't need to collect anything extra to access them. This game also introduces a new move, the slide. It makes movement a bit more enjoyable because if you keep continuously sliding and spinning, you can move a bit faster, and if you slide into a jump, you can go a greater distance. Rather than simply beating a level to progress, you need to collect a crystal shard before the end, and then you fight Zero too. Just, just kidding. Just kidding, that was a really shitty joke, I'm sorry. None of them are hidden, they're all right in front of you towards the end of the levels, it's just something you gotta do. 100%, or whatever the fuck this is, works differently in Crash 2 and Crash 3, but it's still bad to be honest. You need to collect more gems that are all obtained by doing different objectives for each. For example, to get the first gem in Turtle Woods, which is supposed to be the first level, you obtain it by not breaking any boxes this time. After beating the first levels, you face a different version of Ripperoo, do some more stages, then fight the Komodo Brothers, do some more stages, then fight Tiny Tiger, do even more stages, then fight Engine. This guy was kind of annoying, you have to throw a Wampa Fruit at his machine and bust it, but it feels so hard to even land a shot sometimes. Finally, you face Neo Cortex as the final boss, and he is much easier to defeat than he was in the first game. So, this game, what do I like about it? As mentioned, I love the fact that they added sliding. It may seem like such a simple addition, but it really does make the gameplay feel smoother. The difficulty has been toned down a little bit on this game, but it feels more fair in a way and I like that. Not because I'm a scrub, but a lot of the deaths I had in Crash 1 felt very cheap. The level design feels kinda similar to Crash 1, but it's definitely more complex and you could tell a lot more effort was put into these. While they can be annoying, I like the new gimmicks in the levels such as the fireflies and the jetpacks. There's still one big problem I have with the levels in all three of these games, but I'll get to that towards the end of the video. Crash 2 is good. Solid game for the PS1, and uh, obviously that means the remake is pretty solid too. The game still got better though. Time for my personal favorite. Crash Bandicoot 3. <laughs> This game is a huge step up from both Crash 1 and Crash 2. So much more was added to this game to make it stand out between the two. The length of each game is still roughly the same, but Crash 3 was definitely a good move for the series. The level design is drastically different in these games compared to the last two. For the most part, the levels here are based off different periods of time in different countries, and the ones that aren't still feel and look much different. This game also introduced water levels, and yeah, I know as an epic gamer you're supposed to hate water levels, but they are a good way to show contrast between the different levels as they're much different than the land levels. Also, even more types of levels have been introduced. There are these racing levels, levels where you're in the sky knocking down blimps and planes, and some water cruising levels. Also, on some of these levels you play as Coco rather than Crash. There's literally no difference between the two besides the character models, but I don't know, maybe it was added as an illusion to make it appear as if there's more content. Games love doing this, especially in this era. This game has a larger hub world than Crash 2, but it's still very small. You have just as much freedom here as Crash 2 with the order you choose to play the levels in. Play the stages in whatever order, play the boss, and then move on to the next world, or section, whatever you want to call it. Just like in Crash 2, you need to collect the crystals in each stage in order to proceed onwards. 100% or... 
yeah, work similar to Crash 2, but alright, maybe I'll give it a shot one day, but just please understand I'm an idiot who can't comprehend this stuff. The bosses here are Tiny Tiger, Dingo Dial, Entrophy, Engine, and lastly Neo Cortex and Uga Uga. Something kinda big I haven't mentioned yet is that after defeating each boss, you unlock a new move, which is very nice. The best move you earn is the double jump in my opinion, but even with this, the jump still sucks. For the most part, this game did feel like the easiest out of the three. The final boss was nothing compared to Crash 1's. However, there were some difficult sections. The racing levels, as I mentioned before, have really finicky car controls, and even though the movements of the racers are heavily scripted, it can sort of be challenging to master the controls and reach first place. The water levels were certainly annoying, there were a few parts where I didn't know how to proceed normally, so I need to damage boost losing an Aku Aku mask. Water levels, am I right? Something I love in this game is the different aesthetics for each level. It may seem kinda generic for video games, but I love the pyramid stuff in the medieval levels, they just look kinda nice to me. So, what can I say about all three of these games? Well, the soundtrack is nothing amazing, but after hearing the original pieces from the PS1, they were all remade very nicely. For the 50th time, I'm gonna mention the amazing graphics. They're nice. Also, all three of these games have bad depth perception. Don't feel bad if you miss a jump in this game, it's, it's very common. The depth perception is bad. So, that one big problem I mentioned previously, let's talk about it. As nice as the levels look, I seriously hate how much the aesthetics were reused. Something I love about Kirby 64 is that every single level looks different. They really tried hard making the game look visually appealing, and it worked. There are several levels in each of the Crash games here that feel like clones, even though they aren't. They all just look the exact same. It gets old very fast. Could this have been because of hardware limitations? Maybe. But these games aren't necessarily long, and Kirby 64 is an N64 game, a console that was directly competing against the PS1. I do feel as if these games were kind of rushed in a sense. I gotta mention this again, I want to be very clear I'm not necessarily talking about the remakes, rather the games in general. So, the Crash Bandicoot Insane Trilogy. What you get from this purchase is three solid platformer games from the PS1 era. I repeat, from the PS1 era. No doubt these games have outdated mechanics and are generally outdated. They're PS1 games in HD. Nothing amazing, but nothing bad either. The games that came after these three, such as Twin Sanity, look pretty enticing to play and I may try them out one day, but for now, that's that. Guys, we're at over 800 subs now, and last video I said thanks for 600. How is this happening? I don't know. But I love you all, thanks for supporting the channel. Peace.